Welcome to It Started With A Kick, the podcast in which well-known fans and high-profile figures from the world of football talk to us about the first match they ever attended. I'm your host, Richard Foster, and I'm absolutely delighted to introduce today's guest, John Bennett. John works for BBC Sport, mainly on Five Live Sport and also BBC's Live Score on Saturday afternoons, as well as the BBC World Service. Uh, he's covered a host of major tournaments, including AFCON going all the way back to 2012, which we're going to touch on a little bit later, and also Euros, World Cups, etc. He's also produced several documentaries, including one of his most recent, Paris Football's Greatest Talent Factory. I'm hoping you're going to do South London Football's <laughs> Greatest Talent as the follow-up, but um, we'll see about that. Anyway, pleasure. Welcome on board. And... Let's transport transport you back to your first ever match, which was in November 1990 at Filbert Street. Richard, it's fantastic to be here. Real pleasure to join you on the podcast. Yeah, Leicester City against Wolverhampton Wanderers, the 1990-91 season. So my dad took me to the match with my brother and he transported me into one of the worst seasons in Leicester <laughs> history. <laughs> you Thanks, can't, Dad, you can't for that. Glory Thanks so much. Yeah. I, I, you can't call me a glory hunter when it comes to 2016 and Leicester winning the Premier League. I was, I was there at one of the worst moments. In the end, it didn't turn out to be the worst season because at this point in 1990, Leicester had never been relegated to the third division as it was then. We came very close yeah. in this season. On the final day, Tony James scored a goal to, to save Leicester City, keep them up against Oxford United. But then, of course, Leicester did go down in 2008 to League One. But yeah, this was a horrible season for my dad to introduce me <laughs> to the world of Leicester City. Yeah. And as you said, when I, when I looked at what happened this season, you're right. In going into the final game, Leicester were in the relegation zone and West Brom were just above them. Leicester won their game 1-0 and I believe West Brom drew actually at Bristol Rovers. So it was that close. But let's go back to November 1990 and what you remember of that particular game. So you you went with your dad and brother. How old were you roughly? So I was 10 and strangely enough, we didn't actually live in Leicester. So I was born in Leicester or born in Kirby Mutslow just outside. Um, my dad's side of the family always been from Leicester. My mum's actually French, but she moved to, to Leicester for a, for a gap year and met my dad and the rest is history. But we actually moved when I was six. We right. went because my dad's job changed. We went down to a place called Chippenham in Wiltshire. So we lived quite far away from yes. Leicester. And I was getting into football and I started off liking Liverpool because everyone in the 80s liked Liverpool and particularly because of John Barnes. And then I think what happened was my dad gave me a box of his old programmes because he was a massive Leicester City fan, laps Leicester City fan in the 50s and 60s. He used to go, but he hadn't been for years, but he had a box of programmes, basically. So I was delving into these and boxes of tickets. And it really stood out to me as, wow, this is the club I should start supporting because I have a, I have a connection. I don't live in Leicester anymore, but this is where I was born. I have memories of growing up in Leicester. Strangely enough, I remember... When Gary Lineker got married, it was a big event in Leicester. <laughs> I don't know well, how I remember it at all. <laughs> it must have been on the news or something, but it stands out to me. So, yeah, I became a Leicester City fan and I was desperate to go to a It was quite far away. My dad worked mm. very hard in the week. It would be a three-hour drive, so it would take all day, basically, for us to, to go to Leicester there and back. It would be a long day. My mum's not interested in football, but in the end... Uh, after a lot of begging to go, he he took me and my brother to to this match at Filbert Street, and it was it was an amazing day and a rare win that season because Leicester, as yeah. I say, as you pointed out, were awful, but I seemed to bring them luck. Well, you know, you, you know, as you say, if if it's not Gary Lineker getting married, it's John Bennett going to his first game and turning things <laughs> around. <laughs> so, looking at the game itself. Um, there was, you know, it was a reasonable crowd for a Division Two game, sixteen and a half thousand. Which of the players who played that day were any that you just caught your eye and go, "Oh, he's one to watch," or similarly, anyone who you thought, mm, "That's not so great." Yeah, everyone talks about World Cup ninety changing football. I'm the typical example of that. I liked football before, 
But that tournament had a massive impact on me. And really, from, from liking football, I was obsessed by football. So I was really excited about this game because on the Leicester team, we had David Kelly, who I don't okay. know if he even played, but he was in the Republic of Ireland squad during the 1990 World Cup. And yeah. I shouldn't say this as a, as a Leicester fan, but I was really excited about seeing Steve Bull play for Wolves wow. because he was a big part of that, that World Cup 90 side. But sadly, in this game, I missed out on one of the big rivalries in league football at the time, which was, I'm not sure if you heard about this, Steve Bull against Steve Walsh. This, this I, was... I, I haven't heard of it. I, I know both of them pretty well, as in, you know, I've know their careers but i didn't realize they had this enmity tell us more yeah so this this was a quite quite a violent um, rivalry that they had okay. when, whenever they played there was an incident i think before this in the late 80s when they had a clash and one or both of them had been sent off but basically every time they played it turned into a real battle on the pitch and steve walsh who was leicester city captain throughout most of my childhood watching leicester is an amazingly nice guy off the pitch, but on the pitch, mm -hmm. he would take no prisoners. And apparently he would, you know, almost, I don't, I'm not sure if he wrote it down, but he would keep a list of players that he wanted to take revenge on. Wow. Steve <laughs> Walsh's Steve, hit list. Gee. Yeah. So Steve Ball was, was one of these players and Steve Ball is no shrinking violet. So these two would have amazing clashes. Sadly, in this game, though, Steve Walsh, was injured. He's a player who had so many injuries during his career. And this was a time that he missed the game. So Steve Ball stood out. David Kelly stood out. I knew all the Leicester players because, of course, I'd, I'd read about them. I'd started then doing a lot of obsessive research into Leicester City, as a 10-year-old does. But there were some famous players. Terry Fennick played for Leicester in that mm -hmm. game. I think he'd broken his leg or had a serious knee injury playing for Tottenham. David Pleat was the Leicester manager, so he'd given them this, this opportunity to, to find form. In terms of the other players, Ricky Hill was another player who I was quite mm -hmm. excited to see. He played for Leicester because he, he played for England before. Yeah. But you look down the team and it's not a great Leicester team. Gary Mills is another player who stood out because he was part of the Nottingham Forest team, kind of a fringe of player so. where, during the... During the the Clough era when they were winning the European Cups. But it was a poor Leicester team. And you, you mentioned that they only just escaped relegation. This was a season when, I'm pretty sure I'm correct, only two went down. So Leicester finished third from bottom. For some reason, yes. only two went down. Leicester were very, very lucky to stay up this season. But I went three times during this campaign. This was the first time. And mm -hmm. we won every single time. So for some bizarre reason... I, I was the lucky charm. And this went on for, for five or six years. I, I never saw Leicester lose wow. for a long, long time. That is, that is quite incredible. So <laughs> we'll, we'll come back to that. And, uh, you know, mentioning Terry Fennick, so he was on loan from um, Tottenham. Also, the keeper, Mike Hooper, was on loan from Liverpool. Yeah. As you said, you were so originally Liverpool was your, you know, your provisional team. So, you know, David Pleat working his magic on the, the loan market. Uh, Ricky Hill is actually someone who I ha I, I sometimes host um, sessions at a local book festival here in North London. And Ricky Hill, we got on to one because he, he wrote a book about the Rooney rule, about how black managers weren't getting much of a chance in English football and how they brought the Rooney rule, not the Wayne Rooney rule, the Rooney rule into US sports. Um, and, and obviously he had a very long career at Luton uh, and this was towards the, the end of his career. And, and actually when you look at his chances to become a manager, it didn't really happen. And he's always said he was incredibly close. He was in the last two to become Ferguson's assistant manager uh, back in... I think it was it was quite early on, but a guy wow. called Ricky Sabagria came from Sunderland and took, you know, that he was the other one. Um, but Ricky Hill apparently now is in charge of Turks and Caicos Islands, which <laughs> I, I don't think he's going to feature at the World Cup anytime soon, but, but there we go. Uh, so Ricky Hill, yeah, a, a great player. I think he was the third black player to represent England at full international. Um, and you, as you say, the Steve Walsh, Steve Ball thing didn't come off because Steve Walsh wasn't playing. 
Am I right in thinking? So Steve Walsh would have been a centre back, would he, at this point, and then he converted into a centre forward. And that's I had Chris Sutton on a couple of weeks ago, and he, exactly the same happened to him. He started as a centre back at Norwich, got converted to a centre forward, and hey ho, was part of SAS. So Walsh did the same thing. He did exactly the same thing because this this was although this team was poor and Leicester were nearly relegated. This was the start of a pretty glorious era for Leicester City. I was really lucky to to start going now because David Pleat was sacked during this season. I think someone called Gordon Hill took over. If I'm not wrong, Gordon Lee, I think it was Gordon Lee. Gordon Lee, that's right. And at the end of the season, Brian Little came in, and after right. that, it was an amazing few years. And he was the guy who converted not for every game, but for a lot of games. Steve Walsh from centre back to centre forward. Mm-hmm. So there were three playoff finals in a row. They lost to Blackburn, lost yeah. to Swindon, and an amazing game, which four finished three. Yeah. Four three. Leicester was three 0 down. Got it back to three three. Then lost four three to a dodgy penalty. And then <laughs> come on, after- come on, no, let's let's not again. Get- <laughs> Paul Bowden scored, I know, but, uh, you know... It, but the word, can I tell you a story about that, Richard? Can I tell you, this is a Go true on. story. So I'm living in Wiltshire. Uh, as I said, I live in a place called Chippenham, which, and, which is not far from Swindon. So mm. Swindon beat Leicester City in that 93 playoff final. Yes. So that happens. I'm absolutely heartbroken. What am I? I'm 13 at that point, so I'm, I'm in tears. I'm, I'm, I'm upset. I'm just getting over that when we have a sports day at school. And they bring out the VIP guest for the sports day. <laughs> I'm not I joking. know what's happening here. Paul Bowden comes out. The man who's just scored the winning penalty against my team, Leicester City, in the playoff final, comes out as the VIP guest at sports day. Everyone's delighted to see this Wales and Swindon hero, apart from yeah. me, because he'd just broken my heart. But yeah, oh, this, wow. this, this was the start of a glorious era for, for, for Leicester City. Brian Little came in. And yeah, Steve Walsh was an incredible player. A lot said about the violence on the pitch, but he was an excellent centre-back. And when he was converted to a striker, he scored the two winning goals against Derby in that playoff final. And um, it was a shame. I always thought he played in this game. It's funny how your memory does plays tricks. Mm. I, I I was sure that Steve Walsh had played in my first Leicester game, but no, he was out injured. Yeah. So, yeah, having written a book about the playoffs, I do have a slightly odd memory bank of everything playoffs. And as you say, Leicester amazingly were in three playoffs finals in a row, which doesn't happen yeah. very often because usually by the second one you win it. But um, they did, and Steve Walsh, you say, got that double against Derby. You Leicester then went up, got relegated immediately. The next playoffs final, I don't, don't do really want to touch on. Do, yeah, don't do this to yourself. <laughs> and if if I had been at school, I was a little bit older than that. If Steve Claridge had turned up to my prize giving day, whatever it was, I tell you what, he wouldn't have lasted very long because I've <laughs> never, ever forgiven Steve Claridge for that. Anyway, we're, we're not going to go down the Palace playoff route because we'll be here all day. Uh, looking at the Wolves team, as you say, Steve Bull, clearly England player, pretty much. Did Andy Much play? Because there was that famous Bull-Much um, partnership. Again, I thought he did. And I thought Mark Venus had played as well because those are the players that I recognised. And I looked yeah. at the starting eleven, knowing knowing I was going to talk to you, and and they didn't. I'm not sure if it was on the bench. Right. So it was a team I don't know. I I don't know too many of the names to be honest. Mike Stowell is someone I knew because I think he was on the fringe also of the England 1990 squad. Maybe right. he was never called up, but he was talked about. So he was a name I knew. And bizarrely, he he went on to have a very long career at Leicester City as a goalkeeper coach. He was there when Leicester oh, won yeah. in 2016. Mm-hmm. And also, bizarrely, I, I played cricket against him once and I took the best catch I've ever taken at slip uh, to, to dismiss right. Mike Stowell, the goalkeeper who'd been at my, my first game, <laughs> a diving catch to my right. I never told him yeah. that he was at my first game. But apart from that, I don't, rem- I don't recognise too many of the names. Keith Downing, who I think I recognise him because he had a career as a coach, if I'm not right. mistaken. Um, I think Paul Cook was playing, was he? Yeah, Paul. Oh, is that, is that the Paul Cook who went on to be the a manager? Chesterfield, I ah, think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's um, the Chesterfield current manager who obviously did, uh, was at Accrington Stanley and various other clubs. So, like Andy Thompson, Paul, yeah. Paul Stancliffe, Gary Bellamy, Tim Steele. These were not big names to me at the time, but yeah, Steve Paul no. was their star. And it always felt strange to me that Wolves never really managed to get to the 
to the first division in this era, knowing that they had one of the, the best strikers. Steve Ball was clearly a first division Premier League striker. I'm not sure why yeah. they never they were never able to, to to get promotion. Yeah, well, you know, quite. A, I think it's interesting as well for someone who doesn't come from the Midlands. It's this West Midlands, East Midlands things because clearly you've got three or four clubs in the West Midlands who, you know, West Brom, Villa, um, you know, they're, they're, and Wolves, they're the sort of main rivals, and obviously there are other clubs. But then you've got the East Midlands with Forest and Leicester. How aware were you, I and mean, often a 10-year-old you know, won't pick this up, of the rivalry involved? So you, you talked about Steve Ball, Steve Ball, which is a very individual rivalry, but was there a sense of, oh, we're playing Wolves, they're one of our rivals, and were you aware of the away fans, for example, at Filbert Street, which is a ground I went to a few times as a Palace fan. I loved it because it was quite quite intense and it was always what we call a lively atmosphere. Yeah, it was lively. I was aware of the lively atmosphere. That's what really, I mean, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll touch on that in a moment. I wasn't really right yeah. aware of a rivalry, Midlands rivalry. They're not Massive rivals, rivals. They yeah. did become it in the in the mid nineties because um, Leicester City had a manager called Mark McGee, and mm -hmm. um, they they kind of Wolves stole Mark McGee from Leicester. In the end, it turned out to be the greatest thing ever because Leicester brought in Martin O'Neill and Martin O'Neill. Yeah. Sorry to say this again, Richard. It, we we won the plus that year against against Crystal Palace. So yes. I wasn't aware of the rivalry, but looking at it, you mentioned the attendances. I was shocked by how poor they were that season. Because even right. when Leicester are playing badly now, it's always a sellout. But this one, mm. it went up to, they went down to like 10,000 sometimes, but this was 16,000. I'm guessing because a slight rivalry, because Wolves have good players, because they're highly rated, because they were a team pushing for promotion. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, that's, I was aware of it being a very, very good atmosphere. And that, that's what stands out. Bizarrely, I still have dreams about, I'm not sure if it's a dream about the first time that I walked out to Filbert Street, but I do have this, vision of walking up the steps and the first thing you see Filbert Street was a very strange ground Martin O'Neill used to joke that he had to walk new signings out backwards because <laughs> there were two good stands there was one that it became the Carling stand I think when when I went right. to this game it was the old style stand but it was still a quite a nice stand then there was a double decker stand where I was sitting with my dad and my brother behind yeah. the goal but the other two stands the east stand as the players walk out was really, really low, awful, like non-league style stand. And then the stand opposite, which is what I remember when I have this vision of my first game, yeah. was quite a small stand as well. You walk up the stairs, there, I remember there being a box to the left, whether it was a security box or a VIP box or where the mm -hmm. police um, sit to do all the security. And yeah, it was, it was amazing. Sitting at the top of the double decker, there was a huge amount of sound from below us. That was where the proper hardcore young Leicester fans were and that really mm -hmm. stood out to me as wow one day I would love to go down there and experience what that's what that is like because they were standing up and you couldn't see it but you could hear it because we were right above them it was quite a steep stand and yeah that really stands out and the away fans weren't far away from us because they were to our right so we were in the double yeah. decker and they were below us but also it stretched round as well so I remember the Wolves fans being very loud and it being a great atmosphere. And I remember very clearly the goal as well. That's the one thing that stands out because it was at our end. It must have been yeah. second half because Leicester always used to kick towards the double-decker stand. Okay. And it was David Kelly just inside the box, an angled shot which went across the goalkeeper into the net. And when you're in the double-decker, it's almost like you're on top of the action. And I remember looking down and it was amazing. David Kelly was my first Leicester hero. So for me to go to my right. first game to see Leicester win and my best my favorite player to score that 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 really stands out as a as a great memory yeah and then Kelly he was a great striker as you say he was you know Irish international and um played for quite a few clubs but I think probably his golden period was was at Leicester now I, I mentioned this to you before we did this that um when you you mentioned this game as your first that amazingly Darren Fletcher, who was the first episode on this podcast, this was his first match as a reporter. Now, I don't want to say there's a big age gap between you two, and he, he was a very young man at the time. He must teenager. have been very young, yeah. He was, yeah. So he he pointed out 
the, yeah, so Kelly scored the goal. Two weeks later, I don't know if this was your second game. You said you went to three games. Two weeks later, he reported on the next Leicester game where it happened to be 5-4. Wow, over no, sadly, I didn't miss that. Against Newcastle. And, yep, Kelly got a hat-trick. Uh, Mickey Quinn, I think, also got a hat-trick, strangely, in the same game. And Darren mentions that uh, in the old days, you could just have a chat with the hat-trick scorers without any problem. And that they, you know, he was very excited because it was obviously, I think it was probably his second game as a reporter. And there he had two hat-tricks to deal with and they just had a chat together. So that that is, um, you know, something... And he ended up going to Newcastle, David Kelly. That was probably the game. That was probably the game where, he, where, where they decided to, to sign him. Yeah, he, he ended up going to Newcastle. He was yeah. a really good player. You mentioned the, the, the way he was able to get close to the hat-trick scorer. That's one thing I remember about this game. And I used to do it all the time when I went to Leicester games. So we'd get there really early. And this was as much fun as the games. We'd go to the car park and wait for the players to come in. And now if you go to Leicester, I'm not sure what it's like at Crystal Palace, but you, the, the fans can stand around a fence and you can try and yeah. call the players over. And to be fair, a lot of them come over. But back then, you could almost chase the players with their car. So the car would come in. You'd go, oh, that's yeah. Steve Walsh. So you'd run over to Steve Walsh's car. You'd wait outside. His poor wife and kids would like walk out with all these 10-year-olds who were surrounding the car. And that, yeah. that, that I remember that, that thinking that was the best thing ever because all these names had just been on teletext to me or in my football magazines or my dad's programs. But to be able to get close to them, not just see them on the pitch, but walk up to their car and get their autograph. It wasn't really about getting the autograph. It was about standing next to them and maybe saying, yeah. oh, hello, how are you? Good luck for the game. Yeah, so that the fact that Darren interviewing afterwards, he was able to get all the players he wanted. It was the same for the fans as well. You'd be able to get as close as you can to all of these players. And that went on for a long time. As long as Philbert Street existed, I remember being able to go right up to the players in the car park before, before games. There was a funny story with Steve Claridge. He used to turn up late all the time. Sorry to bring up Steve oh. Claridge again. Well, don't, don't talk about Steve Claridge late because <laughs> I don't want to go into his 119th minute. Winner. But, anyway, yeah. <laughs> but every time he used to turn up, so Martin O'Neill would have a, uh, you'd have to get there at one thirty, or you'd be fine. And his car, more often than not, would screech into the car park at, at uh, one twenty nine, and he'd leave it with the engine on, <laughs> door open, run in. With, so the car was still running, all these 10 olds standing around the car waiting for him. Where's he going to come back? And then he'd come back out. And he, he, to be fair, he'd sign all the autographs, but his car was still running. And yeah, it was a, that was the great thing about football then. You you did feel really connected to the players. Absolutely. And Darren uh, talks about that in his episode of the podcast, how that affinity, you know, the closeness is something now you, we've really lost. I mean, players still come in and do, but there's a lot of stewards and obviously there's a lot of yeah. security, which you didn't have in those days. So uh, at least they don't get bothered by 10-year-olds sort of jumping into the back of their car. <laughs> yeah, I can uh, understand why it's changed, but it's, yeah, yeah. it's just... You can understand that. And also you can now understand why people hold those cardboard things up. Can I have your shirt? Because they don't get any closer <laughs> to them. But there we go. Uh, not mo one of my favourite parts of modern football. Um, no, me neither. One of the other things that I always like to talk about to people about those first memories is the kits. Now, mm. Leicester, you know, blue and white have been blue and white forever and ever. And it was... It was by then Walkers, we talked about Gary Lineker, Walkers were the sponsor. Um, and then also, I think Wolves are probably close to my favourite strip of other clubs. I mean, Palace obviously yeah. got the best strips. But the old gold and black is just such a great combination. Was it something that was seared into your imagination? You know, you've been through the programmes, you've been through all your magazines. So you knew what you were going to see, but then suddenly you got your blue and white against your gold and black. Was that something that struck you at the time? Yeah, I'm pretty sure, actually, that in the day, because we arrived at Leicester, I'm pretty sure we went to the club shop and bought one of them. So it was a Buckter kit made by Buckter. Remember them? Um, yes, Le do. Leicester, actually, is quite um, associated with kits because I'm pretty sure Admiral would have been based in Leicester. With it. Uh, oh. And so I think that they're quite associated with kits, but... And this kit is quite popular now. I see a lot of Leicester fans these days wearing this kit because they brought back the retro kits and this early 90s course, kit. Yes, yeah, so yeah. Walker's Chris was amazing. We had Walker's Chris for a long, long time. It was the old Leicester badge. It's changed now, but this was the original Leicester badge. 
Um, yeah, I, I really like the kit, the blue, the white shorts as well, uh, blue socks. It was a brilliant kit. And you're right about the Wolves kit. And I think they were sponsored by Brewer, if I'm not mistaken. Um, oh, good the year. Gold can't, can't kit. Quite remember. Yeah. yeah, the Wolves fans were from that. But they, it was, yeah, again, it, quite evocative kits. And I'm pretty, yeah, I'm pretty sure we'd have gone to the club shop at the time to, to get this, this Buckter kit. And this was the last season of Buckter. And then it went to, we had our own leisure company. We made our own shirts, Leicester City, Fox Leisure. Oh, wow. And Brian Little apparently used to help design the shirts for the next uh, three years. Mm -hmm. Fox, Fox Leisure shirts. Okay. Uh, but you know, all, the, all the kits in the 90s, you see all the youngsters now wearing them because they were they were such amazing, amazing kits. And it had a white collar as well, the Leicester kit, I remember, in, in those days. I've still got yeah. it somewhere. And and you're obviously a keen collector of things. So to say, first visit, go to the club shop, pick up the shirt. Did you, were you, I mean, you see, when I first went to football, people used to wear woolen scarves. I don't think by this time they would have been wearing woolen scarves or bobble hats. I don't know, hats, yeah, but... I think so. Yeah, the, I probably would have been in a Leicester scarf and um, yeah. The, the, yeah, the, um, the shirt. I would have definitely been tried to get all the, all the kit. I bet. I bet I've got an old hat as well, Leicester hat, which I may have well worn then. You're right. I've got a box full of stuff that I used to keep. I've got the program, which I'm showing you right. on, on our Zoom here, and it's um, it's in pristine condition. <clears throat> I'm surprised about because normally this would be what I'd get the players to sign. I don't have any autographs on this one, but yeah. So I would have collected everything. I'd have kept everything, and I'm, I've got the ticket somewhere as well because in those yeah. days, of course, they're trying to get rid of that, but it's the paper tickets and. Yeah. So yeah, that it's an amazing memory, and I'm I'm so pleased that I went to Leicester City in a season where they weren't doing brilliantly. I'm glad I kind of had to earn the great times that were ahead of me. I'm glad I had to earn it by having a season when they they weren't so good. Even though every time I used to go, they seemed to win. Exactly. Who's the cover star of the program there? So we've got Terry Fenwick on the on the cover of the ah, program, okay. and I think there's an interview with Hill. David Pleat's programme notes here, he's still pretty confident. He says, um, the loyalty of our supporters stood out in the last two results at Oxford and Barnsley. The loyalty was running out. I can't remember this, but it was getting quite hostile at this point. They started the season with, I think, six or seven defeats. And Pleat out is quite a famous joke around Leicester because right. that was the time when the signs, the banners were, were coming out to, to get David Pleat out of the club. I, I remember it being quite loud and not I wouldn't say aggressive but I remember it yeah. you know thinking wow this is an amazing atmosphere but I don't remember any anger towards the manager but there definitely would have been anger towards the manager this was a time when they were really losing patience with him yeah as I say he was gone in January so only a couple of months after so can you remember your number two and number three game you know keeping your 100% record going yeah so I think the next one was either Barnsley I think it might have mm -hmm. been Barnsley. I've got the program here. I can, uh, Portsmouth was one and two. And yeah. yeah, definitely Portsmouth, which I think was the first time I saw Leicester concede a goal. And Brighton was another one. And again, they always seemed to play well when I was there. They did seem to pick up when David Pleat got sacked. They seemed to get a little bit better. Yeah. But it was it felt like it was a real end of an era type of feeling about this team. Gary McAllister had played for us not too long before they'd sold him. It was very difficult to replace him. And this team, yeah, we, it was on the way and it was struggling. And it was, we were very, very lucky to stay up that season. Very, very lucky. The fact there was only two went down saved us really. Yeah. yeah. And, and in the overall context of this season, um, Arsenal won what was then the first division. Uh, I will point out Crystal Palace finished third. <laughs> yes, they did. Amazing. Highest so that was the right highest, that the highest, highest ever position. But the, that right and right and um, right, Jeff right, Thomas. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So ninety one. There, there we were third. And typically, English clubs weren't in Europe for obvious reasons. So we never played in in Europe. Uh, well, I mean, some sort of ridiculous intertoto cup, but. <laughs> In a proper competition. Um, the FA Cup, I don't know if you remember, the FA Cup final from this year was the Tottenham Forest and obviously the Gascoigne injury. And then United, who fluked beating Palace in the 1990 Cup final. That, by the way, fluked. I mean, Thomas was definitely brought down in the replay, but we're not going to go on about that. Um, 
they beat Barcelona. Uh, Mark Hughes scored both goals. Uh, it's interesting. Some people are so focused on the club that they support that they don't have a clear memory of what was going on in the general football world. Was that the same for you or were you tuned in to what was going on in the bigger picture? You mentioning everything there reminds me how tuned in I was. Yeah, I think I, I remember huge details about everything you said that I didn't remember that Crystal Palace fin finished third. I've, well, I've forgotten that. Yeah, thanks for reminding me about that. Okay. But um, everything else I, I really remember because, yeah, as I say, World Cup 90 had a massive impact on me. So this would be the time when I'd start buying all the football magazines. ITV used to show the football at this time, didn't they? My family, we never had yeah. Sky during the 90s, but this was the point when I'd be able to watch the games every Sunday. I remember you'd be able to get the match programme for the game that they were showing on the Sunday at the newsagents. So say if it was Liverpool, Arsenal, right. okay. Crystal Palace against Manchester United, they were showing it on Sunday. They do ITV did this thing where you could buy the programme Wow. In the so, so in Chippenham in Wiltshire, I'd be able to buy the program from. Um, I'm sure this is true. Someone might be able to correct me, but I I have programs at home from these games that would have been shown on the big match on Sunday with Elton Wellsby. Um, yes. yes. So I really remember all those times, and I would religiously sit down every every Sunday to to watch it. Mm -hmm. And strangely, I don't remember much about the seasons before eighty nine, ninety, a little bit. But I don't remember, I, I, I can't remember watching when Arsenal won the league on the final day. I don't remember that at all. So that shows you that when I started liking football, it must have been just after that, heading yeah. towards the World Cup that season. And then afterwards is when my obsession really started. And yeah, I, I, I have, I, I struggle to remember World Cups I've been to or Euros I've been to. I struggle to remember details, but I remember huge details about the games you've just mentioned in that season. It's, it's yeah. so evocative, isn't it? When you start into like football, particularly if you're, eight, nine or ten, you, it's all seared into your brain because um, you have an emotional response to these these matches and these moments. Yeah. And also, I find it amazing that so many people saw Italian 90 as the breaking point. You know, that was the watershed moment for so many. You know, British football, English football have been through some real, really horrible things in the 1980s. You know, Heisel, Hillsborough, awful. But that was the moment at which suddenly football wasn't a pariah anymore. It was actually something positive. And yeah, we all know what happened at Italian 90. And, and again, I think, as you said, you started following Leicester when they were not a great team. And England, you know, hadn't been, you know, they, they'd had the 86 World Cup, which was frustrating, but we were beaten by the better side irrespective of Maradona's hand had gone. But then suddenly in Italia 90, we became actual real contenders and obviously hideously beaten uh, on penalties. But, you know, Gascoigne's tears, all that thing just opened the whole of football up to a much more positive and it, it, was, it was just something everyone could get involved in, and they did. And, and and I think that was the first tournament that really happened because obviously the coverage was comprehensive. Um, and can you remember, I mean, your dad was a massive Leicester fan. You said your mum wasn't interested in football, French, you see. Um, <laughs> do, do you remember just thinking, you know, this is part of something now that is a little bit bigger? I mean, it's difficult when you're that young, but did, did you get the sort of swell of popular yeah. opinion. No, I remember details of where I watched games. That's, it had such a massive impact on me. And because yeah. I, I work, my main job is working for the World Service now, and I'm sure it's no mm. coincidence because I fell in love with the Cameroon team. Because that was the opening game, wasn't it, against Argentina yes. when Oman Biek scored the header against Argentina. And it was just such a crazy game. And it had everything really to interest a 10-year-old. Yes. It had the upset. It had Cameroon making some of the most shocking challenges ever, which looked like a computer game. I think it's Benjamin Massing who was sent mm -hmm. off, if I remember rightly, for an awful challenge on Claudio Canigia, but it was so much yeah. fun. It had Diego yeah. Maradona losing, and of course, although I, I can't remember watching 86, we all knew the narrative, and even at that yeah. young age, I, I was happy to see him losing. So, yeah, I remember that. My birthday's June the 11th, and that I'm pretty sure that World Cup was the first game for England. So that was against Republic of Ireland. Yeah. And 1-1 draw when 
Republic of Ireland equalised Kevin Sheedy. Yeah, mm-hmm. I can remember everything about that World Cup. And you look back now, England did well, but it wasn't actually, entertainment-wise, a great World Cup in terms of the amount of goals scored. Um, there was some negative football. The back pass rule was about to come in, wasn't it, because of this type of negative football you saw at 90. But because England did yes. well, because Cameroon did well, I was one of the many, many people, and so many people my age who were 10 or 8, 9 or 10 during that era or, or in early teens, this is when they fell in love with football because it was, it just seemed so colourful. And you're right, the coverage was amazing. I'm not sure what the coverage had been like before 1990 for World Cups, but it was wall to wall, wasn't it? I felt like mm-hmm. for about a month, all I was doing was watching football. Yeah, I remember so much about 90, the 1990 World Cup. And I remember being upset because my brother, because we lived in Wiltshire, my brother is a big Leicester City fan now, but he was an Aston Villa fan for some reason. I remember really being upset, happy when the goal went in against Belgium. But I thought yeah. Steve Bullard scored it. So I was really right. happy. And then he said, no, it's David Platt, it's the Aston Villa player. And I was like, oh, Aston Villa, Aston Villa player. <laughs> yeah, ev- everything about that World Cup was was just amazing. And even now, if, if there's any nostalgic TV show about the 1990 World Cup, I'm in. I, I absolutely love it. Yeah, and as you say, the first game set the tone because you say Cameroon didn't hold back at all. And that tackle on Kinesia, I can visualise it because he goes over and over and over. Yeah. And that wasn't him acting. It's because he'd been absolutely wiped out. And they, they had two players sent off, didn't they? I think. Yeah, that's right. Really they went down to nine men and still, and still they beat the world, world champion. And Crazy. it was yeah, an, an African team had never been to the quarterfinals before. So yeah, yeah. it was great. I ended up meeting Roger Miller and it's I haven't been starstruck many times in my life. I went to do a um, a World Cup qualifier in Cameroon in Yonde. And I was about to fly out, but the lady who was helping me to like set up guests for this program I was doing, she said, I might be able to get you Roger Miller. And um, so literally a few hours before I was flying out, I was sitting down at this handball court because he's got a handball team that he runs in in uh, Yunde in Cameroon, sitting okay. down waiting for Roger Miller. And eventually he turned up in this silver car, this very luxurious car, and ended up having to chat with Roger Miller for 10 minutes. It's one of the highlights of my career, just spending time with him because that that age again he was one of my heroes the way he he kept coming on as a sub didn't he and, yeah. and winning games he was 40 years old no 36 years old at this stage he retired the president then, had called him and yeah. say said please come out of retirement play for play for Cameroon that's what he did and yeah he was he was the big hero of that tournament and the celebration the dancing celebration at the corner flag so meeting him yeah it's one of the highlights of my career absolutely loved it yeah and it, it, yeah, he did have that amazing swagger. He also had the corner flag celebration, almost as good as Jean Philippe Mateta's, but I'm, I'm not going to go on about that. <laughs> um, but so that was something that, you know, then came on top of the fact that you then went to your first game and, you know, Leicester won and then Leicester keep winning. <laughs> The love affair with the World Cup, I think, is really interesting because I'm of an age. Actually, my birthday is not is, is June the 14th. And my 10th birthday was actually when England lost to West Germany in Mexico. Oh. So that didn't go down so well, you know. And, and I tell the story quite often that my mum brought me a cake and I just burst into tears because we'd just lost. <laughs> um, so I, I think there are all these... Football does this thing where it gives you timelines. And, and you can work out, you know, where you are. I mean, I can just about remember my kids' ages, but I do remember World Cups very, very clearly because they come every four years and you know roughly where you are. So that is something that I've found with lots of people I've spoken to this podcast, that it does provide a background. I did want to go back to Filbert Street because that was your first time. And then Filbert Street was no longer Filbert Street, you know, it closed. So how did you take the transition from what was a pretty rickety ground? And as you say, Martin O'Neill took them out backwards because he wanted them to see the the shabby stands. Did you have a fondness of Filbert Street and moving to a brand new stadium is quite quite an odd thing. I, I spoke to someone the other day when they were talking about Middlesbrough loved Ayrson Park, but moving to the Riverside was a big deal, but they still retain affection for Ayrson Park. And similarly, 
on this podcast, we're going to have both Guy Mowbray and John Champion, who are massive York fans, who still are very fond of Booth and Crescent, although their new stadium is quite nice. They still do that. So do you have the same feeling for Phil that's true? Oh, massively. I, I hated leaving. It was it was it was horrible to, to think we were leaving that ground. And even now, we're lucky that King Power Stadium is right next to Filbert Street, which still exists, the street. Mm-hmm. And there are student flats now. But every time I have a every time I walk to a Leicester game, I always have a look over and I've even the student flats there. Um, but you can locate where the pitch would have been. So I, a couple of times I've oh. I'm over a fence and stood on what would have been the centre circle thinking, wow, so that would have been a double-decker over there. That's where I would have stood when David Kelly scored the goal in my first game. I'm just yeah. picturing Leicester moments. Yeah, it was so hard to leave. And I think a lot of Leicester fans felt this. It was a rickety old ground. Bizarrely, they had in the 90s changed one of the stands. They built a new stand. Mm-hmm. And then not long after that, say five years, I think afterwards, knocked it down so we could have the new stadium. We had we had to move and it was a good time to move. But it took a while. I remember me and my dad went to one of the first games at King Power Stadium and it was so strange. Every fan who's who supports the team who, who've moved stadiums will relate to this. It just feels strange. Your whole match day moves really the, the whole way that you plan your day it's a bit different at Leicester mm. because it was right next to the old stadium but even then yeah. you don't know where your seats are you're not next to the same people you, you find it difficult to get your bearings at the stadium and it took Leicester a long long time to get used to it the first season was in the second division or, or championship as it is now mm. probably was back then actually called the championship and then they went back yeah. up and then they went back down and there was a long period when it, it wasn't they weren't successful at all Leicester so it took a long time for the, for the fans to get used to King Power Stadium. But of course, they've had the amazing success, the Premier League win. So now it feels like like home and it is a great atmosphere there now. But I really miss Filbert Street. There was something special about it. And it is, it is sad that the ground you went to your first game in is not there anymore. I am jealous mm. of people like you, Richard, where Selhurst Park is still there and it's still around and you're still able to go, go to that old ground because, yeah, there is a... There is sadness. I've got to admit, every time I go there, I look over to where Football Street used to be because the car park's still there where I used to chase the Leicester City players to get their autographs. <laughs> the car park is still there. You walk, the news agent where I used to walk next to the stadium with my dad is still there. Everything's still there apart from the ground. So you know, I, I do get really emotional about it. I'm not a football romantic in many ways, but with stadiums, I am. I love Goodison Park. Mm. And I, on old ground, I'm going to be really sad when that goes. I love... I don't tell Leicester City fans this, but I love Nottingham Forest ground, the city ground. I think it's an amazing ground, amazing atmosphere. So, yeah, it's sad when these old stadiums disappear.